Hello everyone, we're going to get started here in about 20 to 45 seconds. And while I'm waiting for my screen to fill, feel free to let me know if you can hear this. Hi Daniel. Wow, there's some serious lag here. What is going on? Should be working because I see people. It's just I'm not getting any kind of stream health message yet, and I'm wondering if there's a problem with my computer. Thanks, Hank. Okay, so we have sound. I see you guys. I don't see me. Uh, but we will move forward because I know what I look like. <laughs> there we go. It's working. <clears throat> Did I sound like Anakin right there? It's working. Hi guys, hi everyone. There's some lag. Yeah, well, things are just coming to speed, I guess. Uh, I hope it'll cooperate. Ugh, it's acting hideous. There's something that my computer does, uh, Chrome does, specifically the browser. It flashes the video instead of just showing it, and I hate that because it just, well. Okay, I got that fixed. Serious sound delay. Oh, by the way, I turned down the sound too. You have to tell me if it's too loud or not loud enough. And I might as well do this camera because that's what I'm looking at. <laughs> hey, some of you are stealing my answers. Stop. Okay. Stick this on here. First of all, we got to get a title, right? Awesome, Nicholas. I hope that that fan is working out for your aquarium. All right, so what are some good beginner corals? And uh, I did a poll on YouTube. Let me go check in real quick and see what you guys said. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm creating the lag. I'm downloading, so it shouldn't affect upload speed, but I feel like my whole computer is sluggish, and I don't know if it's the internet or if it's my machine. But let me jump onto here, and that way... I can get away from that. I just want to see the poll. I want to see if you guys voted. Kind of need that information really quickly. Here we go, community. It's so neat to see on the home screen of my page where it says there's a live stream happening right now. Okay, very cool. There are uh, 98 people have already voted in the poll I put up an hour ago where I asked how long have you been in the hobby? And it wasn't that I was trying to have someone tell me, oh, I've been in the hobby 20 years. I'm not looking for that type of answer. I'm actually looking for who's been in the hobby, you know, recently, or who's joined, you know, who's setting up their tank now and is just now buying corals for the first time. And I was kind of curious how big the live stream audience is going to be in that regard. And I know there's going to be others of you in here that, that have a lot of experience. And feel free to chime in in the comments as people ask questions. I have no problem with that at all. Um, and let me know if you see someone evil, and we will ban that person. According to 98 votes, 14 of you basically said that you're new. And 10% uh, of you are in your first year. So I wanted to talk about the soft corals, because whenever someone asks me, what kind of corals can I put in my tank? You know, what's good for my new tank? What's good for me as a new hobbyist? What's in the back of my mind is how much you're going to hate me a year from now. <laughs> And it's true. Uh, many, many years ago, well, when I first got in the hobby, I bought mushrooms. So I'm going to talk about mushrooms for a moment. And I put in a couple that I thought were really pretty. And they spread and spread and spread, and I'll explain why. And soon I had tons of them. And everyone always thought they were really pretty. I mean, they actually said, you know, I love them. They're awesome. Can I have one? And I always told them, yeah, I'll be happy to give you one. But in a year, you're not allowed to contact me and tell me how much you hate me now. And, you know, they always laughed it off. But to be honest, mushrooms, while beautiful and are very good at spreading and filling in dead areas or, or empty areas, will become problematic in time because they take up all the real estate. And as you start saying, hey, I'd really like to try out this coral, you put it in the tank and the mushroom kills it. Um, so when you're buying new corals, the whole point of this conversation today with you is how can we purchase good choices now that you won't regret later. Okay, I'm going to turn down my microphone for a second because I'm going to sip my coffee.
I have been accused of being a slurper, and it's true because I don't like burning my mouth on my hot, hot coffee that I heat up right before I come on the live stream. So I've got a whole bunch of corals to show you, and I'm going to hopefully, yep, that works, switch screens. So this is on the Critter ID section of my website. So that would just be millersreef.com, and then right in the nav bar, click on Critter ID, and you can see the entire group or you can jump to a certain section. I'm in the section right now called soft corals. And in this category, there are a number of corals that you may say, hey, I'd be happy to have that in my aquarium. I'd like to see it grow into something amazing and beautiful and gorgeous. But the problem is, is that oftentimes the soft corals are very fast growers. And because they grow so quickly, they take up that real estate. Let's, uh, you know, I didn't even click through these guys, but, um, I want to talk about the devil's hand for a moment. Let's see what we get here. I'm just, it's been a while since I've been in Critter ID when I was building the new version of my website, and I didn't know if I'd added extra pictures or not. Okay, so this is a devil's hand leather. And what this coral does is it grows upward, and it tends to have uh, ripples or wrinkles in it. And as over time, as it grows larger, it will just drop a piece. And that piece will just fall into your, uh, your reef elsewhere, and you have a frag. Didn't even have to cut it. But I actually think they're pretty awesome until I had hundreds of them. And I was giving them away, I was giving them to the fish store to sell, and I just had too many. So bottom line, when it comes to adding corals to your tank, is usually too much of a good thing is not good. Uh, it, it becomes a problem. But when you have a nice cluster of one coral, and you have a nice cluster of another, you have less of a reason to regret it. So... Uh, by the way, you guys might think the website looks a little weird because I'm logged in as me on my website. Uh, maybe I should log out. <laughs> so we have a clean website like the way you see it. All right. Hey, it's me. So we'll go to Critter ID and go to Soft Corals. Real quick tutorial how to move my site. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about Soft Corals for a few minutes. I know some of you want to talk about other things you can go with, and we definitely will get into that. Uh, the cold coral was the first coral I ever got um, when I went to the fish shore back in 1998. And it may also be referred to as a finger leather, possibly. The cold coral, um, the word cold, I heard this many years ago, I didn't follow up on it, but apparently there's a lot of soft corals that people call cult, and so it gets misidentified, uh, and that can be a problem. But this is a coral that grows large, and those fingers move back and forth in the flow, so it's really pretty. If you uh, want to frag this one, it doesn't sell frag. You would have to take a razor blade and you'd have to slice down one side to trim off a piece. And then you can secure it to a rock with a rubber band. And it's really easy. Within a matter of weeks, it will adhere itself to the rock where you've placed it. And then you can trim off that rubber band or uh, you know, like snip it off so the coral just stays in intact. Now, uh, I had the cold coral for several years. There is one thing to keep in mind. Uh, this coral likes flow. And if it leans into a power head and gets sucked into the intake of the pump, it'll mangle the coral, of course, and, and upset it. Uh, but it's a very easy coral to keep, and it tends to stay in its area. It'll get bigger. It'll become a larger and larger mass, but it's not going to spread all over your tank unless you just kind of ignore it for two years and let it touch every rock you own. All right, let's jump back to another one. Mushrooms. I want to talk about those for a second. And then we will talk about zinnia. And we'll talk about green star polyps. Okay, where did I see it? Here they are. So these are the red mushrooms I talked about at the beginning of my, uh, my live chat now. And you can see that's a normal size flame angel. <laughs> and there is a, I'd say a three and a half to four inch maxima clam down there. And that orange mushroom, uh, I always called it red, but it really was orange. Uh, it had been spreading and spreading, and you can see them. They're all in that picture. They're everywhere. They're at the top. They actually went around the corner. So let me explain to you how mushrooms spread so you know. A mushroom will grow onto a rock. I'm going to switch cameras for one second here. A mushroom will grow onto a rock, and what it'll do is it will spread its foot, or it actually, it's already on the rock, and it will grow onto the next rock. And as it does that, it's going to rip a little piece off, and there'll be a puddle left behind while the mushroom continues to live up here. And then after a little while, you'll see a little nub, and all of a sudden it becomes a tiny mushroom, and then you have two mushrooms. And this is called petal laceration, because it's cutting its, pe its petal off, or its foot. 
So mushrooms will do that. That's one way of them spreading. The other way of them spreading that people don't anticipate is that the mushroom that's planted on the rock through... Uh, actually, I'm not sure how it knows how to do this, but it will spin in the flow and spin and spin and spin like you do a, a, an inflatable balloon until it snaps off, lands somewhere else, and will reattach on rocks further away. So if you see a loose mushroom in your tank and you don't want mushrooms on another end of your reef, you want to catch that guy and either put it back or frag it to someone else, you know, give it to someone else for their tank or give it to your fish store if they're willing to take it. You know, typically they're not going to want a loose mushroom. But you do want to uh, keep track of them because they'll spread everywhere. And on my 29 gallon, they were everywhere. And so when I set up my 280 gallon system, I actually had a guy sitting on the floor on a tarp scraping off every mushroom he could find to make sure not one of them got into my new reef because I swore I'd never put mushrooms in my tank again. And uh, technically I have not. So, okay, back to this. Let's talk about zinnia. My favorite type of coral is the pulsing zinnia, which is this one right here. Uh, it's called pom-pom zinnia. I'm relatively certain it comes from the Red Sea. And the pom-pom zinnia will literally pulse open and close. You know, it's kind of a shame. This, I need video clips in this section of my website. That's one of the plans for 2018, is to put 30-second videos on every critter. But these things will open and close. These little flowers, they pulse open and close. And only recently, some scientists have determined why they pulse. Uh, and that apparently, they are creating flow around themselves to draw food toward them, basically by creating a vacuum. So as they pulse open and close, they're beautiful, they're, they're delicate, they're gorgeous. Women love them. I think men like them too. I, I mean, I did. I thought they were awesome. But they will continue to grow upward. They will not only grow upward, but they will grow onto the next rock above. They will grow up the glass. They will grow toward the light. So if they're on the glass for some reason, and they spread up the glass, you know, like let's say it's the front panel of your aquarium, and as they grow up the glass, all you're going to see is the hideous foot against the glass. It's like looking at algae on your glass. It's not pretty at all. And then the pulsing zinnia is on the other side, which you can't even appreciate because it's being blocked by the foot. So I recommend you put zinnia up high so it has nowhere else to grow. And try to focus on what all it's touching and try to avoid letting it touch other things in your tank, uh, you know, other uh, areas of rock work because it'll spread and spread and spread. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I don't know very very many people that do this, but I, I had a friend here in the local area. He was growing pulsing zinnia in the area of his uh, ecosystem that I would basically refer to as a refugium. And he had it filled with zinnia, tons and tons of zinnia. And he felt that that was helping export nitrate. Uh, at one point, all of his zinnia died. It, it, was a, it was a cascading thing. A pump, a return pump had a magnet that split open and all the stuff in the magnet got into the water, basically, which caused all the flatworms in this tank to die, because he had uh, red planaria flatworms, which then made all the zinnia die. And with all the flatworms and all the zinnia dying, it killed his entire reef, because they were all the same ecosystem. So, again, we're back to that too much of a good thing. Uh, and yeah, it was kind of unavoidable. You know, you just never know when a pump is going to have an impeller that splits open happens to any of us. It, just at some point, you're going to have a failure. That's why we take our pumps apart and we clean them and we inspect them and we replace uh, faulty parts. But he should have treated the tank for red planaria to get rid of them because they cause the zinnia to die. Now, why do I like zinnia so much is because it's a visual indicator of good, clean water. If your zinnia is open and pulsing every day and looking beautiful and lovely, your water's great. And if your zinnia is not happy, something's wrong. And you can just glance at the tank to say, hey, something's not right with my tank right now. So I like it for that. It's like a tank barometer. And, uh, you know, if you like zinnia, having some pulsing zinnia in your tank is a great way to glance at it and see what's going on. It could be stray electricity. It could be alkalinity swings. It could be salinity has changed. They are happy in a certain spot. And when water goes out of that range, they shut down. They start shrinking. They start melting. Um, they, you know, they start rotting. So, pulsing zinnia, cool thing. Their distant cousin, Anthelia, which is this one. I'll get it for you first, and then I'll share it to the screen. Anthelia, where are you? Okay, here it comes. Switching. 
and sorry. Where is the picture? <laughs> well, that is weird. I see I have something to fix. Uh, I'll show you the smaller uh, thumbnail of it really quick instead. So this is Anthelia. Oh, let's see if this will work. Nice. Okay, so here's Anthelia. As you can tell, it looks a little bit different from Pulsing Xenia, uh, and it's very invasive. It grows right at the side of a coral. Uh, it will, like if, let's say, you had an SPS coral that's doing great in your tank, and the Anthelia is eight inches below it, and it works its way up the rock. It makes a skin, and the Anthelia uh, fronds are growing and it will grow right up the side of your SPS coral that cannot defend against it. And it will just murder your, uh, your SPS. It will cocoon the entire stick to use it as rock work, and it will go to the top. And I remember spending an entire afternoon in one guy's house peeling Anthelia off of everything. This is one coral I don't recommend to anyone. I absolutely would not put Anthelia in a reef tank, and if I saw someone with it, I would tell them, don't get it. Uh, that's, that's one of my no-no corals, and I definitely... Don't recommend it to anyone. Now, star polyps. These are popular. Green star polyps, and there's also kind of a pink star polyp and even a white star polyp. They're, they're pretty, they're delicate. Again, they, uh, but they're easy, super easy. You can just put them in your tank, glue them to a piece of rock with a super glue gel. Uh, I do want to point out that, let's see. Man, none of these pictures have, I have got to update this section. I have so much work, oh my goodness. All right, anyway, back on track. Do not glue the wrong side of your green star polyps to the rock. There's a top and there's a bottom. And if the polyps are pointed up, and you know, when you first get this frag, let's say someone gives you a piece, it may just look like a purple skin on the bottom, and it'll look a little bit like a, you know, like leather on the underside, or rubbery sort of. The top will have little nubs that are completely closed, but they're just nubs. The nubs are the top. And those nubs, of course, are these individual polyps that will pop out when the coral is trusting you again and is willing to open up. If you glue it upside down, you'll never see a star polyp. <laughs> so it's really important that you glue it right side down. Uh, the, ru the rubber uh, purple mat needs to touch the rock. And here's the thing about star polyps. Unless you just want them to blanket everything, I recommend you isolate them on a, their own little island in your tank. So it will completely cover the rock and it will uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to bounce around with cameras here. Uh, it will completely cover the rock, and then it'll start growing off the sides across your sand bed. And you can snip it with scissors, you can cut it with a razor blade, uh, you can just rip a piece off, and you can give that piece to someone else. But if you let the green star polyps uh, spread and spread, uh, it could cover all the rock work you were hoping to put other corals on in the future. Some people like to glue it to the back wall of their tank or their overflow box and coat that. There's a guy uh, I know on, on Facebook who posted this incredible picture of, you know, tons of green star polyps across the back of his tank, and it actually was pretty. Uh, it was a very low-maintenance tank, but what was so fun to me was that it had completely grown over his cleaning magnet, you know, the inside part, and so when he's cleaning his tank, you're cleaning with the, the green star polyps, and then when you, when you park it on the side, it was a coral, not a cleaning magnet. You know, it, it was green star polyps, just in a rectangular mag float shape. But, uh, you know, it's kind of masked, kind of invisible. And I thought that was kind of neat. So I did get that picture, but unless he gives me permission to put it on my website, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I, I really do enjoy uh, seeing that kind of creativity. So if you want some green star polyps, or if you want some pink star polyps, then I had some that were pink, and then they could be neon white. They came with my 55-gallon years ago, and I thought they were really pretty. So this is them, and under pure blue lighting, they would glow and look uh, neon, whitish, well, you know, almost like lightning in colored. It was really cool. So these are the corals that typical people that are new to the hobby buy. They will buy... Uh, let's do this. They will buy mushrooms, they'll buy zinnia, they will buy um, uh, anthelia... Um, leathers, toadstool leathers, these are all things that people enjoy getting. But the problem is, is that they can really become invasive in your tank. And that's the point I'm trying to emphasize with you now. It's not that it's wrong to buy a coral if you like it. But what you want to avoid is something that you'll regret later. And so you want to see 
pictures of the coral as a frag and the pictures of the coral as a colony to kind of have a general idea of what you can come to expect so you don't have to basically do a reef teardown to put new corals in your tank to where you have to sacrifice rock and put new rock in because you couldn't get rid of the stuff because it took over. Now, let's delve into a different uh, area of corals because I've only been talking about soft corals. And soft corals are great because they tend to have movement. Um, they grow quickly and fill in areas, but they also can grow too quickly, and that may not be something you'd appreciate. Okay, let's switch this again over here. Let's see. Uh, someone asked, uh, I'm sorry, I, hard to pronounce that name, but uh, asked, is a toadstool invasive uh, because of its size? No, no, a toadstool is actually great. It has one foot and it just becomes giant. And I grew up, I took home a frag from Macna. I believe it was 2006. It was about that big. I took a rubber band, I put it around a rock, I put it in my 280 gallon reef. And when I took it out uh, in 2010, so that's about four years later, it was literally as big around as a 33 gallon trash can. And it was glorious, but the tank was leaking and I had to take it out. So what was a problem about it? Well, I mean, okay, a leather coral sheds. Usually I'm going to say about once a month, it just sloughs off some skin, so to speak. And when that happens, you, that could land on another coral. Might be a problem for you. Um, but basically it makes a big, it takes up a lot of space and can create shadow for things underneath, but low light corals and all the soft corals can handle low light. They don't care about light like SPS corals do. All right. Oops. Critter ID. Let's talk about LPS corals now. LPS corals are large polyp stony corals and there are lots of different styles. I'm going to show you some right now. And I'm going to throw this on the screen really quick because I need to do this once in a while. And we'll change this to 20 seconds. Okay. Um, so here are some LPS corals. You've got your Pagoda Cup right here. You've got the Lobophilia, which, by the way, my Lobos are um, not as happy as they were. I feel like something's going on in my tank. Maybe that brick is st finally pulling out my nitrate. I, I have to test water today and see where we're at. Last week it was still at 40. But I've been kind of watching my copper band butterfly and it seems to be snacking on my Lobos. It could be snacking on the unhappy ones or it could be making them unhappy and then snacking on them. But these are all LPS corals. So if you're trying to consider a coral to add to your tank, these might be some examples you might appreciate. Cephastria is a very pretty coral especially when you get close up to it. You can see these delicate, I keep using the word delicate because most corals are, uh, these little pink mouths that open up against a green skin. Uh, some, might, some might look silvery. Uh, they, this is an encrusting coral. It spreads over everything. I've seen people grow it over uh, um, figurines. Uh, that was a big point of discussion last year. Uh, it can grow over a clamshell. It can grow, grow over rock, tonga branch. Uh, whatever shape you have, this is a nice, encrusting, pretty coral to look at. Um, I'm famous for my fungia plates. I'll just show you some close-ups. So the fungia is a small skeleton with this green oral disc, and mine sticks up these little tentacles. It's a little different than the typical fungia. And I am about to sell 30 or 40 of those at our club's frag swap here in a couple of weeks because I need sand bed. My sand bed is covered. Blastos are beautiful. Um, I enjoy the ones I have at the top of my tank. I have to check on them. Sometimes my tiger cowrie knocks them down. But they come in different colors. You can get a completely red blasto with green mouths. This one here is a, kind of an orange pink with a green area, not just the dead center of the mouth being bright green. But um, this is a nice coral you can actually feed, too. You can squirt food toward it, like reef roids or some thawed rods food. Uh, LPS corals are slow eaters. They don't just close down quickly and snag food. They don't have the tentacles to grab stuff, and other fish and shrimp can run over and steal the food away. But these are really pretty. I'd say this is a pretty slow-growing coral. You know, over time, you'll get little babies along the perimeter, and those will grow into larger polyps. Uh, someone asked if a galaxia coral is an LPS. Galaxia. 
Galaxia. And I think that's in the Softy family. I'm not positive, to be honest. Uh, I'll have to look that one up. Here are, this is a type of Acan Echinata. And the Acan is, uh, Acanthestrea is the name of the coral. Echinata is this style you're looking at here, where they're not individual polyps, but they're all kind of continuous with a lot of centers. But all the, the walls keep touching and it's a continuous mat. Versus an Acan Lord Hoensis. Did I say that wrong before? Here's Acan Lord Hoensis where each one is an individual polyp. So you got one polyp here, you got one down here, you got one over here, you got a little tiny over here. So you got Echinata and you've got Lord Hoensis. And this one, this picture you're looking at right there, because this is switching back and forth, um, shows the feeding tentacles extended because it's trying to capture food and its mouths are open. That's kind of cool. All right. I do like acans, gotta be fed. You're gonna have to feed them at least once or twice a week. I need to look up Galaxia. Like I said, I've never kept one. They had big sweepers. Maybe it is in the LPS family. Uh, here's another beautiful one. This is something that was so popular years ago, and you don't hear people talking about it very much. This is a rainbow Aiken Thestrea, and you can see a lot of colors in this picture. Now imagine it being flooded with blue light, and it'll just glow. It'll, it'll be phenomenal, and you'll see oranges and reds and pinks and greens, and it'll just blow your mind. But um, that's a picture under 10K lighting, and still pretty. I tend to prefer to look at my reef when it's under 10K light. Uh, maze corals are in the LPS family, the brains, the mazes. Torch coral, the uh, uh, frog spawn hammer coral. These are all, and this is one I really like. This is an alveopora. And again, it's an LPS coral. Each of these little... Uh, polyps has 12, I'll call them tentacles or, pol or um, yeah, I'll just call them tentacles. That's, I know that's not the right word for that, but there's 12. Agoniopora, on the other hand, has 24. So there are 12 little sections, and I love the shape of Alveopora, the, the actual heads the, of these, let's call them flowers. <laughs> they just, they're beautiful. And this one here was growing on my 280-gallon reef. I'd really like to get another colony of that at some point. Candy cane or trumpet corals, which is Colastria, are very popular. Easy to grow, super easy to grow. You stick them in your tank and they just become more. Um, a dendrophilia is in the sun coral family. And it is a beautiful coral, especially when you get close up, you can really see the striations inside their tentacles. I'm sure you can't see it on a live stream. But they're, they're a lot of fun to feed. They close down like anemones and they, they just devour the food. I used to feed dendros um, two, three times a week with mysis. So you can just put the mysis right against the polyp and the polyp just closes around like a normal anemone. Um, all of these corals that I'm showing you now are still friendly for a new hobbyist. Here's kryptonite candy cane. And so if you're new to the hobby and you're like, what kind of coral can I put in my tank? If you maintain good reef parameters, which we've talked about in the past, then you can put this coral in your tank and it will thrive. It'll do great. Do pom-pom crabs hurt corals? No, they do not. They um, are looking for food and they're going to try and catch food that's moving through the water column, but they might crawl around your coral trying to get to some food. Yeah, I keep seeing this galaxy. It keeps coming up in conversation. I'm going to let you guys Google that. I don't know the answer to it, so I'm just going to say I don't know. All right, so we've talked about some LPS, we've talked about some soft corals. Let's talk about some SPS corals. Also, bubble corals are really nice. This was my favorite bubble coral. And I'll show you that really quick and then we'll fly out of here. Actually, let me go to the, I wanna go to the link because there's several pictures in this one. This was an amazing coral that I bought and I said, that is the weirdest looking recordia I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was smaller when I got it. I mean, this, at this point it had already grown. But it's basically like a pearl bubble coral. And here you can see it at night with a flashlight. And you can start to see all the feeder tentacles are out. And here it is where it's even larger. But all these super tight bubbles. It's awesome. And it was mixed with pinks and greens. And I loved it. And I've never found one like it again. I had it for several years and then I lost it. And it was so sad because I just saw it deteriorating and there was nothing I could do to help it. And I wish that I could have saved it. Uh, but it didn't make it. 
and I've been looking for a new one like this one ever since. If you see this somewhere, let me know because I want to buy it. And I'd say each of those bubbles was smaller than the little tiny green peas that we buy. So if that gives you any indication. Oh, there's Octospawn right here too. Octospawn is a uh, like a frog spawn, but it people refer to it as an octopus coral. So that is another cool one. LPS corals are fun for new hobbyists. You can enjoy them, you can jam them into a rock, and they just grow. All right, let's jump into SPS. Because some of you guys think SPS is the pinnacle of the hobby, right? Come on, computer. All right, let's try jumping this way then. So first of all, there's an article here. What do you need to know? You know, just read that whole article. It's long. <laughs> and then here are some examples of all different kinds of SPS corals that I've had over the years or that I have happened to see while I was traveling. This does not belong here. That is in the wrong section. I will move that. That is an LPS coral. Uh, you've got bird's nest, bird's nest. You've got Acroporas through here. All different types of shapes of Acropora. There's Montipora in here. This is one of my favorite Montes, by the way. Let's see if that's a decent picture. It's called Montipora undata, and it has these little round circular polyps, and it's got that very interesting kind of, uh, like the rock face of a mountain, and I, I just love this coral. I think it's awesome, and this is not a hard one to keep. It just grows on the rock. It encrusts the rock. But Montipora is a good coral for someone that's new to the hobby because it just grows out and makes these little plates. Sorry, I know I'm just bouncing around here on the website. But for me to add all these pictures one at a time into my software would have been a, a nightmare for me to navigate. So this is a Montipora capricornis. And uh, that's when it was only about three inches across. And I grew this into something that was probably like 26 inches across by 14 inches by about eight inches tall. And I called it the orange blob because it wouldn't make the circular pattern we're so used to seeing with Montipora, which uh, kind of drove me a little bit crazy, but I couldn't do anything about it. Look at all these birds' nests. You got Green's bird's nest here. You've got the pink bird's nest. You've got the bird of paradise. I mean, bird of paradise, it's another very pretty uh, bird's nest. By the way, this one was in Dwayne's tank. That's why I'm using this picture on my site. He gave me permission. This is grown by ORA. So if you can get ORA corals, you can get this bird's nest. All of these uh, corals you're seeing now, they need really good water quality and very stable parameters. So if you can do that, if you can do the things in that article in the top of this subsection of my website, then you can grow some really pretty corals. Um, I'm going to show you another really pretty, another bird's nest. I'll do this one. Look at that. I, that is just awesome. It is such a beautiful coral. And, it just, and on the left of it, there's another bird's nest, another style of bird's nest. You can just kind of make out the brighter green polyps compared to this mainly green one you're looking at now. So these are corals that you could definitely put in your tank and you can grow them and you can be very happy. Now let me tell you something about bird's nest and then we'll continue with our SPS excursion here. Let me switch cameras again. Okay. Um, and while I'm at it, while I'm doing things, I'm going to stick this on the screen. All right. Bird's nest grows really fast. Uh, you can have a little twiglet of it in your tank and it becomes a little uh, golf ball and then it becomes a bigger colony and then Boom, it dies. I mean, just like overnight, it RTNs, which means rapid tissue necrosis. I think we talked about that recently. And it just dies so fast. Um, don't take it personal because bird's nest grows fast, so it dies fast. Whenever I have a bird's nest that isn't doing well like that, like it, it, let's say everything was great and then some parameter shifted my tank and that coral just implodes, so to speak, I don't touch it. Others might say frag it to save what you can. I leave it alone. It's already distressed. It's already dying. Me handling it, cutting it, snipping it, taking it out of the water, putting it in the water, dipping it, all those things just guarantees I'll kill the whole thing. Instead, I leave it alone. 95% of it dies. A few tips survive. I wait another week, and then I cut off all the living pieces. I take out the core, I throw it away, and I put all the living pieces in a little pile on the sand bed, and they all grow to each other, and then I can put them back in the rockwork and start all over again. So bird's nest is kind of a cool coral. I'm not going to call it a resurrection coral because it's not resurrecting, but if any SPS DNA lives, 
that's always potential for brand new coral growth in your tank. So despite losing three months, six months, nine months of amazing growth in your tank, you know, basically losing that time that you just, you saw it become something amazing, you're so proud of it, and boom, overnight you just lose it. Rather than just dwelling on that, focus on the fact you can grow again from what was left. And if you can do that, I think it'll help you a little bit so you don't take it so personally. Okay, um, I want to get back into this type of acropora right here, this pink one that's from SeaWorld, uh, SeaWorld San Antonio. Uh, did I switch cameras? I thought I did. Yes, I did. Uh, this is a beautiful coral. Um, I don't know the specific species. It's acropora. Um, but it's a tabling acropora. And that would not be a good beginner coral. So if you're new to corals and if you're new to SPS, I don't recommend you buy tabling acroporas yet. I, you know, give yourself a couple of years in the hobby, a uh, couple of years of success with some of the simpler acropora and simpler montipora. And if you can keep those guys happy and they're thriving, you could drop in a frag of this and see what it does. I've been, uh, I had, this is really pretty, but as you guys know, last September, I had to cut out huge sections of my reef that had created such a shadow. And this was one of the casualties. This coral, I lost, I think, all of it. There may be a little bit floating around in my reef somewhere, but I think it got completely shaded, lost all the source of light it needed to live, and I lost it. But when you're shopping for corals, you can ask them if uh, it's a tabling acropora or not. Usually the seller knows the parent colony it came from and can tell you what to expect it to become. But tabling acros are not good for beginners. Montipora setosa is typically an encrusting montipora, even though it kind of it's kind of cool. It can grow into an amazing shape like a mum. You know, like the mum that girls wear on their dresses for homecoming? It'll make this beautiful orange uh, carnation flower-looking thing. And I saw that in the fish store, and I was blown away. Now, here's the shape you want a monopora to grow in. You want it to spiral and spiral and loop-de-loop -loop and do layer upon layer upon layer. Very beautiful from above. Not quite as pretty from the side because you're kind of seeing the white of the coral, especially from the underside of it. But seeing it scroll and seeing the leading edge... Oh, and let's talk about that. <laughs> because a lot of new coral keepers don't understand this. They see the tip of a coral is white, or maybe, maybe, maybe light blue. Depends on your lighting. And they think, oh my god, the tip is dying. Well, yes, it could be dying, or it could be new growth. Because as you can see with this coral colony right here, this is a montipora with a purple rim. It's kind of in the light blue area, probably for you guys, but it's considered purple rimmed. And so the leading edge is always purple, but then as it grows out, the green kind of catches up and the leading, you know, the new leading edge will be purple, if that makes sense. So you can just uh, uh, watch the monopore grow and you'll see the leading edge and you'll see it spiraling. If a piece breaks off, you can put that right in the dead center to create a new whirl, uh, a new uh, spiral. That'd be really nice. And here is a side view of a small piece of my purple monopora. And uh, remember I talked to you about casualties? This picture right here, yep, there's only one. Crazy. Why do I not have 100 pictures on here? All right, this right here, this stick, and this stick right here, that's actually blue tort that's completely covered over and murdered by this purple grape monopora. It grew right over it. It grew up the side. There was some blue tort sticking up. It was really pretty and neat looking, but I did nothing. And eventually it grew the tissue over and encrusted it completely and became all purple grape and there's no blue tort. So you have to take care of uh, interacting with corals that you care about and that way you don't end up losing like a blue tort. Um, one person's asking, can any coral grow out of water? Typically we want our corals to grow in the water. There are some species of Acropora that uh, are exposed to air several hours a day in nature, and then the tide comes back in and they're submerged again. But as hobbyists, no, we keep our stuff all underwater. All right. Now, there's a different type of Montipora that I'd like to recommend to you as a new hobbyist, and that would be Montipora digitata. Let's see if I can find any on here. Montipora digitata. These aren't alphabetical, by the way. I don't see any here. I used to have orange digitata, so I thought that'd be on here. Here's some. Okay. Worst example ever. Oh, here we go. That's what I wanted. All right. So this is a, a very nice, easy-to-grow coral. Montipore digitata 
will grow up these little branches and the, the picture's really old. Uh, this is probably about two inches tall, maybe two and a half, right, in the spot. Here's some of the devil's hand leather I talked about before. There's the tail of my mandarin that you've seen before. And here is a palithoa. And I guess we should talk about pallies today, too, while we're talking about corals for new hobbyists. That's an important topic. But um, Montipore digitata is very, very brittle. I mean, you just bump it with your fingertip accidentally working in the tank and it just snaps off. What I did in this case, these were all little pieces I had, and I glued them all to one rock and put it in the tank so they could stabilize and you know, get secure and encrust. But they grow up in these really pretty branches. And you can get them in reds. You can get them in purple. Um, you can get them in green. I think those are the three colors you'll find Montipore Digitata in. Super easy to grow. Great beginner coral for someone that wants to try some SPS. So I'd suggest that to you. Now, let's talk about zoanthids. Only because if I didn't talk about it, people would say, Mark, you didn't warn your audience, so I'm going to do it really quick. There are lots and lots of zoanthids on the market. I would say there's probably 200 plus nicknames of different types of zoas and palithoa that you can buy to add to your aquarium. And I want to point out something else to you guys, um, just being 100% forthcoming. All these fantastic, gorgeous, beautiful zoanthids that you see look amazing when you're right on top of them. When you take a macro shot and you fill your monitor with a single polyp and you're like, oh my God, it's just gorgeous. Let's see if I can find a decent picture I'm in love with here. Uh... All right, let's just grab this. Come on, it's Mary Jane. You guys must like that. <laughs> I mean, it's just a beautiful thing to look at up close. But for me, I have a general rule. When, if I get a frag from my aquarium and I can't see it from four feet away, it's a waste of time in my tank. I'm not going to be this close to that coral when I'm looking at it, ever. Even if I look down from above, it's going to be 20 inches away from me. So I can't really appreciate it unless I take a macro shot to enjoy it on my monitor. So... When you're shopping, you're like, oh my god, I love this one. This is fantastic. I want that one. Or you're like, I have to have utter chaos. Or, you know, these different nicknames that are out there. And you get it. You end up getting something that looks more like this. And it just covers a rock, and you see a bunch of them. And that's the end of it. it it's, it's not this jaw-dropping experience you were hoping for. So just be realistic. That's all I want to say. I don't want you to, to be frustrated or feel like you get ripped off. Because you didn't. I mean, you paid top dollar for the coral you wanted, but you want to also understand that you're only going to see it from a certain perspective. Now, if you have a nano tank that's, you know, six gallons of water and it's, you know, six inches front to back, you'll get a great view. But if you have a 90 gallon reef or if you have a 120 gallon reef or if you have a 400 gallon reef like I do, you're going to have some polyps here and some polyps there and you're going to kind of say, I can't see them. I, I, I just, there's not enough. Um, now let's talk about repurposing, and then we're going to talk about what'll kill you. <laughs> uh, this was actually a great idea. I have a whole bunch of hammer coral in my aquarium, and I have this pink hammer, and a lot of the branches, you know, because it makes a skeleton, and the polyp is on the top, and the coral is always growing. So basically what happens is it keeps making more skeleton underneath as the polyp stays above it, and it gets taller and taller and taller. So you have this huge, long stick of death, basically. I mean, there's no life on it. And when I was cleaning out my tank uh, to kind of declutter, I found a lot of this excess dead undercarriage, so to speak. And I cut it all out and I pulled it out of my tank. I pulled out a lot. I pulled out a bucket worth at least. And someone said, why don't you save some of that branch and plant zoanthids all over it and make a stick of zoanthids? And I thought, that's such a great idea if I didn't already throw those away. <laughs> so if you're ever thinking, what can I do with my zoanthids besides a frag plug or on a single rock, you could grow them on some coral skeleton or on some Tonga branch. Tonga branch is uh, something you can purchase from the fish store. You might find it online too. And it's a great way to create a bridge that the fish swim under or swim around. You know, it's kind of fun. And it can be covered as zoanthids. Zoanthids can grow up your overflow box. There was this thing years ago. I wish I had... No, I don't have any here. Sometimes I, I have little things floating around like, oh yeah. 
I had this little magnet. It was really cool. It was called an Aquamag, and you can still buy them to this day, I believe. So you've got this disc that kind of looks like asphalt, <laughs> sort of a light gray asphalt. And within it is a magnet, and you put your zoanthids on this. And then on the outside of your tank or on the inside of your overflow box was the other magnetic piece, which was like a pill case. And the magnet was inside and it was sealed. And so you'd put the Aquamag on your overflow box, those zoanthids, and you would wait for them to spread off and onto the overflow box. Then what you could do is you could trim it, so to speak, pull the magnet out and move it to a new spot, and those guys on the overflow box will continue to grow with the goal of eventually covering the entire overflow box with zoanthids. That would be really awesome. Not very many people successfully pull that off. Typically, when you do have something that grows up the overflow box, it's one of those inv invasive species that you really didn't want in your tank in the first place. Cough, cough, anthelia, or uh, what we call Texas trash pallies. Uh, everyone hates them here in Texas because they spread like wildfire. Yeah, they'll cover your overflow box and hide it, but they're hideous to look at. So it's not like you're going to have Mary Jane zoanthids growing up your overflow box. You know? <laughs> so that's the unfortunate part. Now, let's talk about how zoanthids can kill you. And I have to do this from time to time because there's always new people coming in the hobby. If you're already in the hobby for a while, you can go get yourself another cup of coffee. Zoanthids and palithoa have something within them called palitoxin. And it could be one of the reasons why fish don't eat them. Very few fish will nip at zoas other than, because there's always an exception to the rule, the hippo tang. So if you have a dory in your tank, he may continually go after zoanthids, which is amazing. Um, I have these beautiful ones that, well, I had and I don't have any, and I miss them like crazy. They were called Mean Greens. So I know it says two worms here, but it, it's the zoanthid I want to talk about. These guys right here. These were probably one of the first zoanthids nicknamed way back in 2002 when there was no names yet. We were just calling them zoanthids. And the guy that took that picture, uh, or took pictures of my tank, called them Mean Green Zoanthids. So the name stuck. Anyway, my hippo tang would attack the Mean Greens to where they looked like they were tattooed on the rock. And they were uh, no three-dimensional. Literally, it looked like I took a rock and I painted zoanthids on there and stuck it in the tank so I'd have something to look at. That's what they looked like. It was amazing. And uh, I could not add zoanthids to my tank because of that hippo tank. It was constantly going after them. It was just the weirdest thing ever. And uh, whether it ate them or just wanted to be a bully, I don't know what, but I got rid of the hippo tank and all my zoanthids literally lifted off the rock and opened up and became happier again. So, but other than that, I can't think of any other fish that I'm aware of that bothers zoanthids. Uh, but zoanthids themselves and palithoa, or the large pallies that we like to put in our tanks, contain something called palitoxin. And palitoxin affects your nervous system. And so we always warn people, be careful with zoanthids. But all we're talking about is common sense. So, if you're handling zoanthids like you're fragging them, or you're trying to put frags in your tank, or you're trying to move some, or you're trying to peel some off a rock. No open wounds on your hands. Don't get anything squirted in your mouth. Don't get anything squirted in your eyes. If you were, and this was a story told by Anthony Calfo many years ago when he was a coral farmer. He was working in a greenhouse filled with corals, and he was telling us how I mean, the story, it was hilarious how he told the story. He says, the first time I got poisoned with palitoxin was, and he went into the story. And then, you know, then five minutes later, the second time, but, so, anyway, I'm not going to tell the whole story because it was hilarious and long. And you know. He was working with the corals, and then he would wipe off his hands on a towel, and then, I guess, if his, hand, if his face got wet, he would take the towel and wipe his face that had the coral excretions on it, and that made his tongue go numb, uh, made his eyes burn, uh, it made his skin itch. So, palitoxin's a real thing. Some people, and you can Google this, some people end up in the hospital with it. Very few doctors know what to do with palitoxin. Uh, it's not like they're familiar with coral species. Uh, you can tell them I'm, I have palitoxin uh, poisoning, and they will find a cure. I mean, maybe you could Google this in advance and be ready in case you do something dumb one day. <laughs> and I don't want you to do anything dumb, that's why I'm telling you, be careful. But... Um, it could be something as simple as Benadryl and IV fluids get you back on track. Um, I have been handling zoanthids since I got zoanthids. 
and that would be uh, 16 years, and I've never even had a hint of an incident. So how have I stayed so lucky? How have I avoided being murdered by the palytoxin? Don't get it on your face. Rinse your hands all the time. I mean, literally, I reach in the tank, I'm doing something, I go to the sink, I rinse my hands and clean my hands off on a towel. I am not scratching my face. I'm not licking my fingers. <laughs> Do not lick the Zoas, okay? That's one of my inside jokes from an older video. Uh, it would be dumb to put Zoas in your mouth. Uh, the flowery coral itself has a mouth in the dead center. And if you were, like, trimming it off of a rock with a razor blade and you're trying to get under the, the foot that could trigger the coral to squeeze and squirt out fluid, which could hit you in the eye or the face. So I have seen pictures of people wearing safety glasses, wearing a face mask, uh, wearing rubber gloves, and wearing an apron. If you are that concerned about palytoxin, then yes, you should dress just like that. I don't dress like that at all. Yes, I wear glasses, so I guess I have a cheat. But other than that, I rinse my hands, I don't handle anything in my tank and then touch my face. Just like when I go to the gym, I touch the machines. Boy, I do not touch my face. I don't want, you know, everyone's got the flu these days and everyone's in the gym and, you know, I hear coughs and sneezes and there's sweat everywhere. And I'm really cautious not to touch somebody's sweat and then get it onto me. Um, I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm grabbing a paper towel and I'm wiping it off as I get on the machine. So anyway, point is working in your tank, touching corals, rinse your hands. Don't scratch your nose. Don't, you know, get any liquids anywhere it doesn't belong, all right? Common sense. Uh, if, you're working with if you're working with a lot of zoanthids, you know, not if you're a... Um, if you're a coral vendor and you have to handle corals all day, I don't think this video is going to save your life because I think you already know this stuff. But for the average hobbyist that's working with a few corals in their tank, keep in mind, too... Remember I said in the beginning of this video, too much of a good thing? If you say, okay, I need to work on this tank, and you know, you've been putting it off for months, and you say, I'm going to work on it all Saturday, and you spend eight hours in your tank handling corals nonstop, you're way more likely to do something dumb just because the duration, your, your focus gets soft, so to speak. So if you're planting two or three corals, or you're fragging a couple, and you're done, you're great. But if you're trying to really revamp everything, like I did with Dwayne in September, that was a massive job. Trust me, I went back and forth to the sink a lot as I handled each huge colony I took out. And I didn't have any weird effect. Uh, Dwayne didn't have any weird re reaction. None of the people that were helping got any weird reactions that I'm aware of. Uh, no one told me anything. So, common sense. Common sense. Yes, one person said complacency kills. So, just be careful with it. Now... I'm going to just quickly say a few things. Don't boil anything on your stove um, that has to do with your aquarium. Uh, you are not trying... You know how uh, doctors and, uh, and dentists, they have this, this device. Dang it. Why is the word like in the front of my forehead and won't come out? Uh, it's this thing, autoclave. I think that's what it's called. It's like a, an oven with steam, and they make it completely pristine so that they can use that tool in your mouth or in your body. Uh, I think it's autoclave. And that is a way to completely sterilize something. We don't want to sterilize anything that comes out of your tank on the stove because if you were to put that rock that used to have zoanthids on it or mushrooms, because I hate mushrooms, or cyano, because I hate cyano, if you boil it, you're turning all that's on that rock into an aerosol and you're breathing it. And there was some people in Australia last year that apparently were doing some cleaning on their tank I'm assuming they were boiling it. Maybe they were not. Uh, maybe they're just scrubbing with a brush. But even that motion of brush, 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 you're misting, and that air is in the air, and you could mist this crap, this palytoxin, into the air and breathe it in. It gets in your lungs, and it could really hurt you. So be outside. If you're cutting big corals continuously for hours with that uh, Griffin saw I showed you, you know, the one with the bandsaw, do it outside where it's fresh air. One of my good friends in Dallas was fragging with his friend, and they were working indoors. I think the weather was bad. And they ended up going to the ER because they'd been fragging a bunch of corals, and I guess the bandsaw was aerosolizing it because, you know, it's, again, misting as it cuts through the coral. That, and you're just working this coral, and you're just, your mouth is hanging open, and you're breathing. 
And that right there will get you. Keep your mouth shut <laughs> when you're fragging corals. <laughs> Number one rule. Close your mouth. That's really, really, really important. Uh, don't breathe in the fumes. So that's it. That's pretty much everything I want to tell you uh, on that one. Common sense, caution, awareness. If for some reason something got in your eye, got in your mouth, rinse your eye, rinse your mouth, watch yourself carefully. If you aren't feeling right, run up to the, to the uh, ER and see what you can do. All right, one person said, I just saw it here a second ago. He said, I wonder how come fish don't die when they eat the zoanthids, like that hippo tang. I have no idea. I don't have any idea. All I know is I have one hippo tang right now in my anemone cube, and I'm going to have to move it out at some point when I'm ready, when I feel like it's just too big for that little tank. And I like it in there because it's a different color, you know, and it started off really tiny. But eventually I have to move it out of that land of tentacles. And when I put it in my main reef, I'm wondering what it'll do to my zoanthids. The other choice is to put in the 60-gallon frag system, which is a nice long run, and it, it would look pretty in there too, so I might do that. So I have choices. All right. Um, how are we doing? Oh, okay. I got to wrap this up. I got a couple things to talk about. Thanks for, very much for paying attention to this part. Uh, let me tell you about two things coming up. Number one, DFW Mass is doing a frag swap um, on, Mar on February 24th, so it's in a couple of weeks. I will be there. I am going to be bringing dry goods, of course, um, but I will also be bringing some stuff for my reef that I want to sell. So if you want to come to that, you can go to dfwmass.org, click um, calendar, and you'll see the information for where and when. It's on February 24th. And then on March 3rd, I'm flying to Seattle, and I'm going to be speaking at ReefWorks, which is another uh, frag swap type trade show with a bunch of vendors. And uh, that's very exciting. So if you're in that area and you'd like to attend, please uh, sign up. In the description of this video is a link to the frag swap for DFW Mass and the link for ReefWorks on Facebook, their page. So I already put that there for you now. So if you can't remember or whatever, you can just scroll down to the video description under this and just uh, click the link and that'll do it. I also included a link to my Critter ID section on my website. The Critter ID section, like I said, it's a work in progress. It's um, Everything getting transferred over was a lot of work, but it needs a lot of meat added to it. So I apologize if you feel there's not enough data right now. For now, it's just kind of basic descriptions where you can look at something and learn what it's called. And you can say, oh, I like this, or, you know, or I want this, or I have this and I don't know what it's called. You can look at all my pictures and find what matches it. Okay? That's what it's there. Eventually, that'll be really fleshed out. There's going to be more videos attached, more pictures attached, and better descriptions. So that's all coming. And uh, then finally, finally, um, I just wanted to give you, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to do this for you guys. I'm going to give you a quick gym update. I have now been to the gym for an entire full month. These are all the ones with the yellow was personal training. And uh, all the other dates where there was writing was when I went by myself. And after a month of going to the gym, I haven't changed any weight, which is hilarious to me. I literally weigh the same. But I have gone from a 22 BMI to a 20 BMI, and my jeans are, I told you before it was too loose, I'm down two sizes. So I'm shifting stuff, which is kind of awesome. Um, I'm really happy about that. It's just weird. You'd think that the scale would go lower, but I wasn't really overweight. And I didn't go there to lose weight. I went there to strengthen my back and to quit taking a leave because I take a leave every day. And I'm taking it less so I think it's working. My goal is, is to strengthen the back. And I joke that I want a back like Quasimodo. I want all the muscle back there. But they're making me work on my core and, and do burpees and push-ups and planks and work with all the different machines, and I'm doing it. I got me an Apple Watch, and I uh, got it two days ago. And I found it that I could link it to what I was doing, and so it tracks my heart rate as I'm doing the Stairmaster and as I'm doing the elliptical and as I do the rowing machine. And uh, the activity thing is really cool. And I'll tell you this. This is interesting. So some of you may not know what I do for a living. I'm going to wrap this up. Um, I sell things for my website. I build things out of acrylic for customers. I sell products from a bunch of different lines, like Blue Life and uh, Coral View and uh, uh, Two Little Fishies. Um, and of course I sell my RODI systems with the filters and the membranes and all that, but I work from home. And 
I have never really known how much I move. Well, now that I've got this guy on me, tracking me, because I don't keep the phone on me. You know, I put it down and I, I do all my stuff. Uh, two days ago, I walked 4.2 miles. <laughs> I had like 8,000 steps inside my home working. So, yes, I'm a very active person. And it's, uh, it's really funny to me to think that I covered 4.2 miles in my little tiny house. So, that I don't, I'm not sedentary. I don't just sit here. I'm always on the move. And I remember yesterday, I, were, I was all day, I did the gym, and I finally lay down on the sofa to watch a little TV. And I was 20 minutes in, and my watch said, you should get up. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it actually recommended, you should get up for a minute. And I was like, I've had a long day. I think, and it said I'd been on my feet for 12 hours. So um, it needs to learn how I am and quit telling me what to do. Anyway, that's it. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, I'm going to see what I can do to crank out a video this next week. I didn't put anything in the middle of the week like I wanted to. So let me see what I can come up with. Maybe I can focus some time on, um, on that Fiji trip that I did a couple months ago because that's really going to be nice. And other than that, I hope you have a great weekend. Test your water. Post your results on Instagram because we share our results there. And uh, if you can do it, uh, use the hashtag post your results. Hashtag water testing at me loves reef so I can see your results. Make sure your results are posted um, publicly so everyone can see them. Uh, because if someone's not following you, it's going to be invisible if it's set to private. And finally, follow me on Facebook because that's where I share all the cool things. So it's real easy. Facebook.com slash me loves reef. I share all kinds of nifty videos. I shared a really cool video yesterday about nudibranchs that's only about a minute and a half long. And I think you might enjoy it. That's it. Talk to you guys really soon, and I'll be reading all your comments under this video later.